Um, hello, Julie, how are you? I am doing well. Um, we are very close together, but not sitting right next to each other. So hopefully yeah. there won't be a little bit of uh, feedback in the audio, but uh, we can, we'll see. Uh, is there feedback? Can you put in the chat if there is audio feedback? Because I can manage my muting or something. Okay. No. Someone, thank you. Guy says no. So thank you. Um, I've got a quiet in my ear, so hopefully it'll be all right. Um, terrific. Maybe just super fast, you could do super fast intro to yourself. Yeah, sure. Um, so my name is Julie, and I um, am a founder at Capulet, just like Darren. And um, we have worked together for um, almost 20 years on um, a variety of different digital campaigns, um, have done all kinds of um, digital marketing from things like media and publications to nonprofit work. And um, we're going to talk a bit about customer journey mapping today. And that's something that um, I do really often at the beginning of projects with clients. Okay, uh, terrific. Thank you for that. So to begin with, yeah, we're talking about user journeys or, or customer journeys or something in the nonprofit sector, they're called supporter journeys. Um, sometimes they're called buyer journeys um, and journey mapping. Maybe you could just start by talking, uh, telling us about what those are and how do, what do we use them for? Yeah, so a journey map, um, it actually works really well with um, the persona work that you were just talking about, um, Darren, because uh, a journey map is really thinking through um, a way, the way a person interacts with your product. So a product can be a book, it can be a podcast, it can be something on Amazon, it can be an experience, it can even be an entire organization or a company. Um, so it's actually a visual uh, exercise that um, we do with a whiteboard or with um, post-it notes where we can really visualize the steps that an individual takes when they're interacting with the thing that we're marketing. Um, and, you know, the reason why we do this is because um, if you've done your persona work and you have somebody in mind who's your customer or your reader, um, then it really helps us generate empathy for that person and the various experiences they go through between hearing about a book and buying a book and then consuming the book. Um, it helps us see those uh, readers as individuals, as actual real people who are going to have this experience. And it helps us actually visually see problems in their um, experience. So maybe in their buying experience, um, maybe they can't find the book where they want to be able to find it. Um, maybe there's something about the title that makes it hard for people to remember and so they can't search for it. Um, so we can actually see little gaps when we uh, visually do this work. Um, and, you know, it really allows us to get inside our customers' heads and really think, okay, from their perspective, what is the experience like? We think about it so much from our perspective because that's how we think about everything. Um, but then we don't recognize that we, of course, have all kinds of um, bias that uh, we think, oh, well, you know, everyone's going to love this book. Everyone's going to love this um, product and everyone's going to know how to find it and it's going to be a good experience. If we think that way, we're going to leave a whole bunch of people out of the process. So that's why we do this work. Yeah. And it's very sticky note centric. It's, it's a lot of post-it notes. Yeah, it's a lot of yeah. post-it notes, which is actually really fun. It's also, um, you know, in this work, in this digital work, we spend so much time on um, computers that this is, I think, one of the most fun parts of starting a project. It's like physical, it's visual, it's just really different from some of the other work we do. And so we talked, we're gonna do a little example of this. And we talked about um, 
uh, using an example that you have, have of, of a like publishing product that you've used in your personal life recently. Do you want to just talk about that for a minute? I'll share my screen and just show it to people in case they aren't, aren't familiar with it. Yeah. Um, so I feel like I was marketed to um, for about like <laughs> two years, maybe a year and a half. Um, before I finally bought my masterclass sub, uh, subscription. So I'm sure you have also been followed around the internet um, by masterclass, but uh, it's basically a series of um, very short courses that you can take um, by pretty famous people. So if you want to um, learn about acting, you can get a little acting class from Natalie Portman. Um, if you want to learn about cooking, Gordon Ramsay can teach you how to cook. So, um, you know, it's, it's got a ton of um, star power and they've done some really interesting marketing around it. Um, and I finally, after a very long time of being marketed to, um, bought a subscription. And so we're kind of doing this exercise as if we're the masterclass company, as if we're the pub publisher or the, the company that runs masterclass, but we're, we're doing it about you as a as a, a person we imagine experiencing this right yeah yeah okay so i'm going to be the uh, uh writer and drawer if you want to walk me through there's basically a series of things we investigate um and maybe you can just walk me through what the which the what the first one is yeah so what we do is we start by um thinking through the actual step-by-step -step experience so what is the experience like for somebody who um, maybe sees an ad for the first time and then goes all the way through to buying their subscription? So because this is just a short demonstration, we're only gonna pick a few steps, but when we do this um, for a client or for a new project, it can be, it can be like 50 steps. Um, which sounds overwhelming, but when you think through each thing, like, you know, I probably saw, I don't know how many ads <laughs> on Facebook for Masterclass, many, many, many ads um, before I made the next step. And so, you know, we could think about that as one experience, um, but I would probably put it as multiple experiences um, because I kept seeing them through my, my whole journey. Um, but so I, I wrote saw ad on Facebook. Yeah, saw ad on Facebook. So another way that um, Masterclass markets to, to people is they do um, promotions. So they do like a friend um, mail, like email a friend and if they su subscribe, you get. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what it is. They change it all the time, but you get some kind of uh, referral promotion. Mm -hmm. And so that happened to you? Um, so that happened to me. Yeah, since I've signed up. Okay, so friend, so I'm yeah. writing friends, emails, promotion. Yeah. And so um, I have a friend who uh, emailed me a promotion. Um, and I didn't actually even act at that point. Um, mm -hmm. But then the other thing that Masterclass does, and which was the kind of final um, conversion point or sale point for me, um, is that they had um, a special offer where they, if you pay for one subscription, you get two. So you can give it as a gift to somebody else. So it's kind of, mm -hmm. if you think of it that way, you think, oh, it's almost half price because I'm getting two for one and then I can give one away. So ads, a like personal promotion that is basically a friend recommendation, right? A friend sent that email to me. And then finally, for me and the experience before I bought was the, um, the special offer. So we're documenting your like step-by-step -step experience and uh, it's okay. I'm just kind of, it's okay. I can't read this, but what I've got here is saw add on, this is your experience, a customer's journey. Saw ad on Facebook, friend emails, promotion, saw special two for one offer, signed up on website. 
And then we have a bunch of other steps after that. We're not done by any means, but for today, that's where we're at. Yeah. So then the next thing we do when, when we um, do the customer journey is that we think about and we label um, who's involved in that experience. Um, so the person who emailed me the promotion, so my friend who basically endorsed it and um, suggested through the promotion that I sign up. What was their name? Their name is Jai. J A I. Yeah, and you might, um, if we're doing this from the company perspective, we might make a few notes about Jai, his relationship to you, and yeah, his age and something like that. We won't worry about that. Why I even bothered reading that because it came from him, right? Because he's a close, yeah. mm -hmm. fairly close friend. Um, and then uh, there would be more people through the process because I've definitely um, talked well, to fr other you, friends about it. Did you, who did you give the two for one deal to? I gave it to my sister. Sister, yeah. right. Okay. So your sister's name is Leah. So I'm going to put that on here. And then um, often when we do this kind of, uh, as we do go through this process. So now I've written Jai and Leah here in the next, next row. Um, we'll do this process and, you know, the person will interact with a company. Like maybe you had a customer support issue and you interacted with, you know, Joe from customer support um, or, um, you know, different processes. There are phone calls involved. There are physical interactions. We documented all that in that row, right? Yeah, yeah. for sure. And then the uh, next row? Yeah, so then we think about the systems that um, one interacts with. So, mm -hmm. you know, I would, I would call a Facebook ad, um, a system or a process. Um, and so, uh, having the experience of clicking on the Facebook ad, um, what did that take me to the right place? Did the ad match my expectation, um, would be something that we would think about. Um, and then the whole sign up process, how easy was that? How frustrating was that? Um, could I do like a single sign on with Facebook or with um, Google? How, you know, how um, smooth was the transition from signing up to be able to immediately consume the media? Um, in this case, um, it was pretty smooth. <laughs> They're, they have a fancy system, um, but that's not always the case. We know that, especially um, if you're doing something like um, selling a self-published book uh, that's not on Amazon or, or you have your own um, kind of indie publisher, sometimes those systems are really um, kind of kludged together. So, um, so those are the systems, even the email that I got afterwards explaining how to access all the information. And I would say even now, the emails I get on a pretty regular basis that tell me about new um, courses. Yeah, I ran out of pink post-its, but I would definitely put an email one here too. So I've written the Facebook ad campaign here. And there might be other tools and systems, internal tools and systems that uh, interact with that Facebook ad uh, campaign. And over here, I've written the website I've written the CRM, which we talked about earlier today, the customer relationship management system where Julie signs up and she gets added to the CRM. And then I've written the e-commerce platform because those are often three separate pieces, all different systems where you go to the website, you sign up in the CRM, and then you pay in the e-commerce platform. Even though it may look all seamless to you on the front side, there are different systems in the back end. So we document all those systems there. So the next then, thing is yeah. the by far the most interesting part, at least for me. Um, and that's when we look at um, those steps and um, the processes, and we start to put um, people's attitudes um, and feelings around the experience. So, you know, we can do it in, in a sort of like a timeline, right? So I would say, um, around the Facebook ad campaign, something that I was feeling was curiosity. 
Um, there were all people I recognized, celebrities doing things. Why were they all doing this? What was this about? So curiosity. Um, and then when I got the email from my friend, um, that's somebody I trust. So I kind of felt some confidence, I would say. Um, confidence that um, my friend wouldn't recommend something that was super crappy to me, hopefully. So I thought, okay, well, that must be quite interesting. Um, and then um, when I got the promotion or the special offer, um, I think the feeling was that it was like worth a try. Like the risk just got removed because it was about the same time as my sister's birthday. And I thought, oh, great. Okay, I'll, I'll buy this, get this two for one. I was going to get her a gift anyways. Um, so it just felt kind of a confirmation of it's worth a try. Um, and then I think the technology platform's pretty good. So I feel pretty satisfied with the experience of using it on a relatively regular basis. Um, so all in all, my emotional journey um, through interacting with it has been quite positive. Um, one thing that I would say maybe has been negative, which I could um, put somewhere between um, curiosity and actually making a decision to buy is that I was advertised to pretty aggressively in Facebook. And so they allowed me to see too many ads. So I saw so very many high ads. frequency. We would say a very high frequency. Yeah, too high frequency. So I was starting to feel slightly harassed um, by masterclass. And if I hadn't have had the experiences of um, the kind of confidence that my friend was telling me it was good. Um, and then having a real reason to buy, um, I may have never bought and I may still be being harassed by masterclass, which would actually have totally changed my emotional experience um, with the company. So I, I don't know why, but we always put the emotions at the top. <laughs> you know what I mean? they're so the most important. The... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's what it looks like. And this is just one, you know, so we've got the discount post-its and they don't stick. Um, uh, this is just one little tiny section of the timeline, as you say. And like, as you say, this can be 50, it can go all the way around a room, around two or three sides of a room where we um, array all the steps of the process. And sometimes we will even like break up the process, right? So maybe for this person that's signing up, but it's for another person um, they are trying to cancel or they are trying to upgrade or, you know, and we'll have different groups of people, you know, in a session, like in a meeting, work on different sections. Okay. Um, so that, thank you so much for that. That in a nutshell is what user journeys look like and how they work and how they kind of integrate into the audience analysis persona piece. Uh, are there any questions on that? Um, uh, just before we move on. I like that one of the books I can see behind you, Julie, is blog marketing. <laughs> uh, we've From only like got that 2007 because, or something? Yeah. It's because I, because I'm quoted in it. So that's why we have it. <laughs> it's just ego. It's just sheer ego. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, as I explained to the class and as I explained to you, Julie, we also just wanted to spend a few minutes on messaging because that's mm -hmm. also something you're excellent at and you do all the time. And um, yeah, I, I didn't do a good enough job of explaining, I think in the last class, what it is and how it, how it works. So I would just like to have a conversation for 10 or 15 minutes about, about messaging and the, the role it plays in marketing and, and why it's so important. Um, so, I mean, I, I know this is a slightly challenging abstract question, but what do we mean when we say messaging? Yeah, so when we're thinking about messaging in a marketing context, um, we're thinking about what, what does our audience need to hear and understand? 
um, to be able to act in some way. Um, so I think the term messaging is, is such a strange, um, strange word. That's what, that's what we call it. But in some ways, I think it's easier to think of the concept in terms of key messages. Um, mm -hmm. And it really links back to this persona work because one of the things, and also I think you were talking about segmentation a little bit earlier, um, if I overheard correctly, um, that if you are thinking about the person you're marketing to, they have different needs and different interests and um, they need to hear key messages that make sense to them. And so we can talk, we can talk about um, publishing in a second, but I, I'm just gonna give another example first because a lot of the work that we do is around advocacy and that is working with organizations who are trying to get the government to do certain things like invest more money in BC parks or um, make some changes to environmental laws um, to strengthen um, some of the processes and evaluations around um, environmental projects. So, you know, in that, in those cases, our audience is the government. And so what does the government need to hear um, to actually make decisions about whether or not they're gonna invest more money in parks or whether they're going to consider um, rewriting environmental laws? And so, you know, if we were, if we were talking to a family of, um, a young family with kids and talking about the importance of parks, we would, we would talk very differently than if we were um, giving key messages to a government. And so if you don't do the persona work, moving on to the messaging work is really, really hard um, because you don't know, you don't have in your head who you're talking to and what they need to know um, to be able to make a decision. So um, Darren and I talked about an example to use um, to talk through messaging and it's, it's a good one. Um, and uh, if we think about, um, Malcolm Gladwell's, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use his new-ish new book. It came out, I don't know, six months ago or something. Um, Do you want to just briefly say who Malcolm Gladwell is in case folks don't know? Yeah, so Malcolm Gladwell is a Canadian journalist and um, podcaster and author who has had a number of best-selling books, and he kind of writes about um, psychology and how that, um, how human psychology informs uh, our actions and the way we think about things. Um, and he's quite entertaining. That sounds boring <laughs> when I describe it that way, that his publicist would not be happy with that key messaging. Um, but uh, he's actually a really um, interesting figure. He's got a great entertaining podcast. And um, you know, when, if I was marketing his new book, one of the things I would do is I would do that persona um, exercise and um, I would think about, okay, well, who, who would buy this book? Definitely, I would make a persona for people who have read past Malcolm Gladwell books. I would make a persona for people who are um, fans of his podcast. And then I would um, do the customer journey and I would think, okay, if I was a fan of his podcast, um, then what would I need to hear um, to be able to purchase the book? And so you already have a, as a fan of his podcast, you listen to him every week. You feel like you already know him. You're already interested in the kind of work that he does. And so the key message to that group and probably to the group who's read his previous books is that it's more of the same thing you love about Malcolm Gladwell. That's the, that is the key message for that um, audience and that segment. You won't be disappointed. If you already love Malcolm, you're going to love this book even more 
because A, B, and C. But if you make a persona for um, somebody who has heard of Malcolm Gladwell, but has never consumed um, his media, then your key messaging is something very different. Then your key messaging um, is you don't have to necessarily introduce him from start to finish because that persona has heard his name, has maybe seen his books before. So may, they might be in the curiosity phase um, that I was in when I first saw the masterclass ads. Um, so the key messaging for that audience might be um, you, uh, you're missing out if you um, aren't reading Malcolm Gladwell's books because they're entertaining, because you're gonna learn something, because it's like the best book you're gonna read this year for fascinating dinner conversation. So um, that kind of missing out message or um, uh, something you've always been interested in, this is the, this is the best introduction you're ever gonna to get to Malcolm Gladwell um, would appeal to that segment. And then finally, if you were doing a segment of um, audience or a persona of somebody who had never heard of Malcolm Gladwell before, then your key messaging for that person um, might be something like, um, learn how um, your bias, your subconscious or unconscious bias is um, contributing to Inequality. In, in, yeah, inequality or contributing to, um, you know, relationship issues or, you know, anything like that. So it's almost a better yourself um, kind of message. And so for that person, you know, you would definitely be wanting to get Malcolm Gladwell on um, interview shows. You would want to make sure that the book is reviewed in the New York Times and a bunch of places. He's a big name, so that'd be easy to do. Um, but uh, you need to get him out in front of an audience that's not familiar with him. So you can see that so, it's one book, but potentially three, maybe, maybe even five different um, uh, sets of key, key messages or five different ways of messaging the book. So just to review, you were like, the super familiar audience, more of the messages around more of the same. You love his previous books, you love his podcast, more of the same. Um, what did you say for the middle one? It's um, somebody who has heard of Malcolm Gladwell, but hasn't yeah. ever um, consumed his work. So for that, I would be like, you know, you've, you've heard it's good. Don't miss out on his newest book. It's the best introduction, best Malcolm Gladwell book, which yeah. is probably not true, actually. But if I was um, marketing it, I, I might just say it's the ultimate Malcolm Gladwell um, experience. If you haven't read Malcolm Gladwell before, this is the moment. Right. And then for somebody um, who is totally unfamiliar, you kind of go at the subject and you might go at the subject matter of the book that's about about understanding bias and understanding in the context of 2020 and inequality and racism and some of these topics. Yeah. Because yeah. Because if, if you're thinking about a persona type who has never heard of Malcolm Gladwell, then trying to sell them a book based on the, um, you know, compelling points about Malcolm Gladwell is not, that's not going to be interesting. They're not going to mm -hmm. respond to that, that, that won't um, peak their interest at all, but the subject matter might. Mm -hmm. Terrific. So yeah. So um, and we should say too is that it's not necessarily, for example, that that first audience wouldn't get would get nothing on inequality or a subconscious bias or those topics. But that message would be just kind of secondary. It wouldn't be the headline message or the main message you want to get them. It might be one of several secondary messages. Yeah, I think so. I think. The kind of, and that's why we, we say key messages, um, mm -hmm. because really it is a bit uh, overly simplistic to imagine that there's just one message um, that an audience needs to hear. So it's kind of the headline and then sub messages. Um, 
but yeah, for that first group uh, who is already a fan, um, the headline is more of what you love about Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah, and, and um, you know, this is, I guess I'm, I'm also saying this in kind of a simplistic way, but it is so often you are uh, just trying to identify the key elements or characteristics of the thing that will, that will appeal to an audience. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like so that if we turn this book of 109 walks in Lower Mainland, objectively, this is a book of maps and trail guides to 109 trails, but the message might be, get out more and have more, spend more quality time with your family or mm -hmm. get in better shape um, this summer by doing a lot of hiking, right? Or um, improve your mental health and well-being by getting into nature. Those are all three like messaging options that we might use here um, for different audiences or depending on which one we might think is best. Yeah. So one last thing, um, thank you for that. That was very informative. I wanted to just talk a little bit about some of the ways we test messaging because as I was saying earlier about um, audience analysis and hypothesis and, and personas is we make a lot of hypotheses, right? We make, we develop a lot of ideas, but then we need to test those ideas. And so can you talk a little bit about what we've done in the past, maybe to, to test messaging? Yeah, um, that's the part where we add a little bit of science um, to creativity. So, you know, some of the ways that we've tested messages are we have done focus groups. And now uh, in this kind of COVID-19 world, um, we would do them more often online, but there's lots of um, great ways to, and in very inexpensive ways to do that online. Um, so you can actually have like quite an in-depth conversation with a group of people using a tool that actually resembles, the functionality resembles Facebook quite a bit. So it's an interactive um, conversation um, amongst people. So you might want to, for instance, try to find people who match, are similar to the personas that you've created and invite them to a Facebook, or sorry, not Facebook, invite them to a focus group and um, have that discussion, actually show them different messages and um, see if you're uh, notions are actually ringing true for real people. Mm -hmm. We've also um, tested them with Facebook ads and uh, that's kind of a fun thing to do. And to be honest, full messaging is tricky to do that way, but um, testing things like um, taglines or testing things like book titles, I think would be a great um, thing to do using Facebook ads. And so what you do is you just um, would put out a series of Facebook ads using maybe th the three titles that you're imagining for a book. Um, and then you see which performs best, what people click on more often. Um, so that's quite a fun thing to do. Um, and then we've also used um, kind of polling um, and it did the kind of different um, polling software, but um, I've used some polling actually inside um, SurveyMonkey before, which is a survey tool that some of you may have used. And Darren, I think you've used polling just with Google's polling tool, right? Yeah, there's a Google tool. There's, I also used a tool called Pollfish once, and probably called Pollfish. Um, and I was just gonna say, sometimes we even test just a few words in a message because mm -hmm. we're not sure what word is going to resonate best. I gave this example at the very first part of my first lecture of the difference where people thought about the words urban, rural, and suburban. But we might, um, like the classic example in our work might be, um, we might run some ads. Let's say we were naming a book and we were trying to decide on the right word to put in the subtitle of a book that was about climate change. And we, we might run, I mean, this conversation is done now, but five years ago, we might have run Facebook ads to compare the use of the word climate change and global warming. And we might run exactly the same ads, except for those two words being different and see which ones get clicked on and engage with more, because that could tell us something about which words are more resonate with people. And we would also do, uh, do this with images too, right? If we were testing images for 
book cover or for some design work or something, you would run uh, images and see which ones were uh, people engaged with more as well. So yeah, it's definitely a, a, thing, a bunch of ways we test messages. The other thing um, I would just say about that is um, clients love it when we do that because mm. they love the data. Um, and it's also a great way if somebody um, that you're working with is producing something like a, a book and they love a title and you know it's not good, um, then you say, okay, well, let's run a test on that and see. And you put a couple of titles together that you think are better. And because you are a marketer, you are probably right. And then you get the data in and you're like, oh, look, your title just didn't perform that well. So I think we better go with this one. Um, and people tend to just be like, oh, okay, well, the data says so, so let's do it. It's much easier when you have data to convince somebody that um, you know, the messaging, uh, one, one piece of messaging is uh, better or just getting more response than another. Yeah, and I guess the last thing I wanna say is, uh, we both have writing backgrounds, but the individual words matter a ton, right? We think super carefully about each individual word in the key messages. Yeah, yeah every single one. And we one. have this exercise we do, which is one of the kind of the, the ways we deliver key messages is we make a, a version of it that is 10 words, one sentence, one paragraph and three paragraphs. And actually getting that thing, that message down to 10 words is quite challenging at times. Yeah, it's easiest to start with the long paragraph and then work your way up um, yeah. to, the, to the shortest thing, yeah. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions for Julie before we wrap up uh, about messaging? You can put them in the chat. Julie and I will chat for 30 seconds. And uh, about what? Oh no, I don't have any topics. Um, uh, well, um, I'm glad you put Malcolm Gladwell's podcast in the um, chat because it is uh, pretty entertaining. Yeah, it's, it's quite good, quite good. Um, okay, well, everybody say thank you to Julie in the chat at least then. <laughs> Uh, Hi. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> My pleasure. It's fun to, fun to pop in. Yeah, we might, we might have you back again. I think. Well, I'm, okay. I'm just okay. usually okay. sitting 10 feet away, so. <laughs> okay, bye everybody.